Welcome, everyone. And thank you for joining us. My name is Leslie Waterhouse. I'm a League of Women Voters member and the moderator for today's League program to learn about the Northern Lights Express. The League is a nonpartisan organization that encourages informed and active participation in our government. And we believe that citizen involvement in public discussion is important to our democracy. This event is being hosted to provide information on the NLX, which is an acronym for the Northern Lights Express. NLX is a proposed higher speed passenger rail project that would provide rail service between Minneapolis and Duluth. NLX is a Minnesota Department of Transportation project and information can be found on their website or by contacting MnDOT. The League of Women Voters of Minnesota has no position on the proposed NLX. It does not advise for or against this project. So before I introduce our guest speaker, I want to let attendees know if you have questions, please send those to me in the chat to be asked. We'll have some question and answer time at the end, and I will ask as many of the questions as time allows. But with that, I'm pleased to introduce and welcome our guest speaker for today's program, Jill Brown. Jill is a public information consultant for the NLX Alliance. So thank you, Jill, for joining us today to talk about this project. And I will turn it over to you to share about the Northern Lights Express. Thank you, Leslie. I appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to be with you today. Uh, the Northern Lights Express is a very exciting project and having the opportunity to talk to you about it is greatly appreciated. I'm looking forward to your questions and the conversation we're gonna have. To set the stage, I'm gonna start with a video and then we're gonna do a few PowerPoint slides to give you some background and then we'll open it up for discussion. So we're going to share screen. This will take a couple of moves, but we'll get it going here in just a couple of seconds. Igniting imagination. The Northern Lights Express will provide high performance intercity passenger rail service between Minneapolis and Duluth. As an alternative travel option, NLX will be safe, reliable, and frequent. Using the latest Amtrak equipment, NLX will provide four round trips per day, topping speeds of 90 miles per hour, getting you from the Twin Ports to the Twin Cities in two and a half hours. With stops in six cities, including Minneapolis, Coon Rapids, Cambridge, Hinkley, Superior, and Duluth, travel will be more comfortable and convenient to get to college, work, medical appointments, family gatherings, and getaways. The Northern Lights Express is beneficial because it allows students like me to be able to access transportation north to south of Minnesota very easily rather than owning a car, uh, rather than riding the bus. Once at your destination, you'll have connections to a wide range of transit options, including light rail, bus lines, and bike trails. A recent study found 88% of those surveyed are in favor of Northern Lights Express, with nearly as many supporting the use of state funding to make it a reality. If Minnesota invests $99 million, we'll be eligible for up to 80% federal funding, or $396 million to build NLX now. Improvements made to the existing tracks for safety, reliability, and capacity will also benefit the movement of freight, adding efficiency to our nation's supply chain. You know, any project that modernizes and improves the Grassy Point Railroad Bridge essentially improves the reliability of the transportation network in this region. The Northern Lights Express is shovel ready and is estimated to create approximately 3,000 new jobs during construction and an average of 500 jobs annually. These are good jobs good paying jobs for building trades, for transportation, and jobs that support all Minnesota families. From concerts to sporting events, NLX will also foster tourism activity with an estimated revenue of $400 million over a 40-year period. So that was the introduction to our um, project. And now you should be looking at a PowerPoint slide. Am I correct? So Northern Lights Express passenger rail, as you saw in the introductory video, is proposed to operate between Target Field Station in Minneapolis and the depot in Duluth with stations in Coon Rapids, Cambridge, Hinkley, and Superior. We're proposing to use existing tracks unlike uh, some of the other projects going on in Minnesota right now where, where they're running into trouble trying to lay track and it's affecting their budget and their timeline. 
The tracks are all in place for Northern Lights Express. This was a passenger rail service at one time on, until in, in the 80s. It was Easter Day in the mid-80s when passenger rail service was discontinued. And um, there's been interest in renewing it practically since the day after. Four round trips per day, operating at 90 miles per hour maximum. The average speed, of course, would be closer to 60, 65 miles per hour. Travel time from end to end is just under two and a half hours. We anticipate ridership will grow over a period of about five years. Uh, by the year 2040, a million annual rides. A one-way trip on Amtrak service would be estimated at about 30 to $35, and that's from end to end. So let me back up one second and explain who the NLX Alliance is. They are my client. They're a joint powers board, which means they are government entities that came together for the purpose of investigating the possibility of restoring passenger rail to this corridor. They formed in 2007. They have been my client ever since 2007. Their mission remains to support a data-driven process for evaluating whether passenger rail should return. Uh, they are, the board is currently chaired by Minneapolis City Councilman Andrew Johnson, and the vice chair is Superior Wisconsin Mayor Jim Payne. Participation in the NLX Alliance comes from Hennepin County, Cambridge, Pine County, Sandstone, Superior, Duluth, and the St. Louis and Lake County Regional Rail Authorities. Over many, many years of study, going back to 2007, uh, the Alliance has led the charge to find out what are the benefits of restoring passenger rail, what are the risks, and we're going to talk about a few of the benefits first, and these have been borne out in study after study going back to 2007, showing that there would be uh, benefits in the area of safety, environmental sustainability, economic competitiveness, and the quality of life. So some of the things under these key benefits include 3,000 jobs during construction, 150 million in increased property values around the station areas, uh, grade crossing improvements where roads meet track would reduce crashes by up to 130 over 40 years. And I would add reduce heartache over loss of life or limb uh, due to these crashes. The environment gets a boost when we can invest in transit options like passenger rail. Emission savings uh, valued at reductions of 50 million. And there'll be additional tax revenue from the, uh, the added economic activity around the stations, 375 million. So when uh, consulting firms looked at what will it cost to build and operate NLX and what kind of return can we get on that investment? they were able to show that the benefits exceed the initial capital and annual operating costs. In fact, for every dollar we invest, uh, they expect to return between $1.10 and $1.69 in these types of benefits that we're looking at here. Who benefits? Veterans, older adults, workforce, students. These are just a few. In fact, students, that, that young gentleman you saw in the video at uh, Duluth, he actually lives in Andover. More than 40%, it's just under 50% of the students at UMD are coming from the Twin Cities area. And they would find a reliable, cost-effective, weatherproof way to get back and forth between the Twin Cities and Duluth with the Northern Lights Express. But back to the top of the list, veterans. On the northern end of the corridor in St. Louis County, there's more than 15,000 veterans today. Uh, at a Senate Transportation Committee hearing, January 30th, a veteran testified from St. Louis County. And he explained that his, as his Parkinson's is um, progressing, he's needing to come to the, the Veterans Hospital here in Minneapolis more often. And he's coming down in a van full of other veterans. Um, he's He's at the mercy of everyone else's schedule, and the van often doesn't have room for his wife to come along. And he expressed to the senators that he would greatly like to bring his wife along, and the train would be an option that would allow him to do that because of having space and a little more flexibility on when they could come and go. Older adults, we see in many different studies that isolation is a risk for seniors. 
And as we age, many of us want to age in our communities. Uh, we want choices. Key to being able to age in our community and not get isolated is some transportation choices. And LX can help move people in the corridor. Workforce, what a change we're seeing in workforce in recent years with COVID. You may recall seeing articles in the Star Tribune about people moving farther north to access more affordable housing and then commuting to their jobs, not every day, Monday through Friday, but once, twice a week, a pay period. People are looking for more flexibility in where they work and where they want to live. If we mentioned how many veterans there are in St. Louis County, and the whole corridor, it gets up over 50,000 veterans, 50,000 veterans who would have another option for accessing services. And even on the northern end of the corridor, we see a higher rate of veterans than other parts of the state. So where are we at today? We're at an exciting point today. The Senate Transportation Committee has already heard uh, uh, the bills on the proposal for $99 million in state funding that would unlock up to $396 million in federal dollars. The House Transportation is going to hear us coming up here pretty quick, and we're in the governor's budget, and I'll get to that in just a second, too. So the $99 million that is being asked for right now would um, be focused on the safety improvements to the existing tracks and building or modifying those six stations. Uh, the testifiers that came to the Senate Transportation Committee on January 30th represented business, labor, uh, the, the tribe. The tribe is on our Joint Powers Board, the Mille Lacs, uh, corporate students, seniors, and veterans. Uh, the, the governor has included $19.9 million for rail corridor safety on this particular set of tracks in his uh, bonding proposal. And the House Transportation Committee will hear the bills on February 21st, a week from tomorrow. So it's moving at a good clip. I was in my spot here. Uh, at the Senate Transportation Committee, uh, senators who are not in support of the project had opportunities to ask questions. And I want to touch on some of the questions that are being brought up by people who are not supportive of NLX at this time. The, in the high level, they want to know, is NLX going to be like North Star? You know, why are we investing in private railroad tracks? What's the subsidy and who's going to pay it? And who's going to ride? You know, do we have enough people to sustain a service like this? And now we're going to touch on each one of these in a little more depth. So will NLX be like North Star? Well, the NLX Alliance response is North Star should be more like NLX. There should be connections between two metropolitan areas. Uh, right now, North Star goes from Minneapolis to Big Lake. And Big Lake has seen a tremendous amount of growth, but it's not the same as Duluth. It's not the same as having two anchors on, on the ends. Uh, North Star Commuter Rail is for commuters. It's designed to take people from the suburbs and the exurbs in the morning to downtown Minneapolis, and in the afternoon out back to their suburbs and exurbs. Passenger rail, inner city rail is different in that it provides service throughout the day and serves more than just commuters. It serves the students and the tourists and the people who wanna to get to the doctor's appointments, the people who wanna take in the sporting events and the culture that's available in the evenings or on the weekends. So it's a broader audience, a little broader mission than uh, North Star Commuter Rail. Why are we investing in private railroad tracks? Well, the safety enhancements that we make to the tracks are really to protect the traveling public. Uh, we have 166 grade crossings from Minneapolis to Duluth, many through Anoka County, many, many through Anoka County. Each one of those has been um, surveyed, inventoried, and put in a queue for safety enhancements, whether it's better signaling. As you get into greater Minnesota, you come across those crossings that they're kind of like the camel's hump back. The road approaches it and comes up and over the tracks. That's not a very safe way to have cars mingling with trains. So those roads would be, those approaches would be fixed. There are bridges that are in need of repair. There's one in Duluth that is one of those switch 
uh, swing bridges. So it gets out of the way of cargo ships coming in and out of the harbor there at, at Duluth. A couple of years ago, a part broke on that bridge. They could not swing it. And it was like the Suez Canal. Everything in the harbor backed up because of one freight bridge that was down. The investments we make that can serve passenger rail will also greatly enhance freight all along the tracks. What's the subsidy and who's going to pay for it? Very good question. NLX response is we are anticipating a $7 million a year subsidy that uh, federal assistance would be available to help us for the first six years. Uh, the Minnesota Department of Transportation plans to apply for a grant called Restoration and Enhancement from the federal government. So in year one, 90% of that subsidy is covered, and then they wean us down to by year six, 30% of the subsidy is covered. Discussions are happening right now about how Amtrak does this in other states, and they're doing it in 28 other states where they partner with uh, the local Department of Transportation to offer service just within the state. And I mentioned, you know, every form of transportation we have is subsidized. So it's not unusual to be looking at a subsidy for passenger rail, and it's an important conversation to keep having. Who's going to ride? Do we have enough people to make use of this? Well, it's working in 28 other states. And if just 2% of people currently driving up 35 had the choice to get on the train instead, we would meet our ridership projections. And that doesn't allow for the growth of population and use that's coming. So I'm, I'm pretty confident that there are people who are going to ride NLX. There are going to be people ride who have no other choice because they aren't driving by, by choice or the disabilities. Transportation insecurity is a term we're gonna hear more of. Uh, one in four Americans is unable to count on transportation. And the University of Minnesota was just awarded a large grant, $6 million, to design a program that identifies and addresses things that are contributing to transportation insecurity. I think, it's a policy discussion. I'm curious to know what, what your thoughts are. What role does the state play in making sure people have reliable transportation? Is it something that, that we should be weighing in on more? I want to leave you with a few images of what modern train travel looks like. Uh, there is a new school. There's a new batch of um, rolling stock that will be showing up here in the next few years. Very comfortable seats, lovely views out the windows. Uh, drive time becomes productive time because there are tables and Wi-Fi and comfortable working arrangements. And it's more accessible if you are in a wheelchair or if you want to bring your bike and enjoy trails along the corridor, um, much easier to move around on a train than in, say, an airplane. So those are the introductory comments I wanted to make. And then I was hoping to have a conversation with you to see what you're thinking about the project and about transit in Minnesota. Thank you, Jill. Um, I do have a few questions that were submitted. So I'll start with just going through those. The first one um, was a question, what is the hard number for the 2% of current car users? That starts at like 700,000 rides in a year and eventually grows to a million by the year 2040. All right. And I have a couple of few questions um, that have been sent about ridership. So the first, um, is the proposed train orientated toward our workforce or is it more orientated toward leisure travelers? Both. The nice difference between commuter rail and passenger rail is that passenger, this inner city passenger rail spreads out those routes throughout the day and throughout all seven days of the week. So you serve more than the commuters trying to get to the nine to five job. I have a couple of questions on um, transportation options when people get to their destination. Uh, so if travelers take the train to Duluth, um, what transit is available for them after deboarding um, to access vacation destinations or to get to the local campus or hospitals? 
Mm, good question. So if you get off the train in Duluth, you are about a block to the uh, bus hub, which sends buses in all directions. It's easy access to Skyway. You can walk uh, over the, the bridge that goes over 35, and then you are uh, at the aquarium and at uh, all the, the amenities that are there um, along the water. Since starting in 2007, Lyft and Uber and shared bikes are all new options that weren't there when we started working on this in 2007. And I'm excited to see what else develops. Another question was, um, why not go all the way to Two Harbors? Well, right now you could get to Two Harbors on the scenic train that leaves the Duluth Depot, which is the destination for NLX. Uh, and that runs seasonally and often. They have special events that go to two harbors. So right now, um, it is doable. And will this have night runs for evening events? Or yeah. Is that something that's proposed? Yes, those four daily round trips will be spread out to allow evening usage too. Perfect. The next question, since one of the proposed stops is in Hinkley, what are the projected riders in a year for the casino? Mm, I can't, I don't know a number for the projected riders in a year at the casino. I can tell you that in the early stages, um, the casino, uh, the tribe paid for an additional study to determine if it would be worth the cost of laying track right to the casino. And they determined it would not be worth it. I, they are gonna be running shuttle buses uh, the, the station in Hinkley is right next, it's, it's close to downtown. Um, I had been told in those early days, and I haven't verified it now in a long, long time, that the traffic going to the casino was similar to the volume of a city of a million people. It's a very popular destination. Mm -hmm. Is the casino offering any type of contribution toward the project in lieu of taxes? Yeah, well, the, um, the tribe is a member of the Joint Powers Board, and they do make an annual contribution to the operations of the NLX Alliance. Okay. And the next question, um, many Anoka County board members have been opposed to continuing the relationship with the North Star. What role, if any, would Anoka County government have with the proposed NLX line? Right now, the Anoka County board has no role with the NLX Alliance. The Anoka County board, a different county board, was involved in 2007 in the initiation of the organization. Um, but the current county board pulled out, I'm not, I can't remember off the top of my head how many years ago. So the NLX Alliance has moved ahead without them. And then there are also a couple um, questions on cost. What are the anticipated yearly operating costs? The total, the total annual operating, I don't have it at my fingertips. Is it, ooh, I'm going to, I'm going to be close. 16, you know, I have my handy, dandy, talented intern uh, sitting next to me. I'm going to hand her a stack of papers and ask her to find it. I think it might be in there. So I don't have it wrong. Uh, okay. When we pull out the, the uh, fare box recovery, the, the ticket prices that people are paying, what it was remaining is about $7 million. And that we're asking the state to pick up after the grant is, is used up uh, that we anticipate from the federal government. So maybe we go on to the next question and Angelina will keep looking for the operating cost. Sure, yeah, we can circle back to that one. The next one, um, do we know once funding is secured, how long it would take to start running the train? Okay, a quick Angelina, she's good, she found it. As soon as I said, let's move on. Uh, the cost for actual operating costs is 18.9 million. So fare box recovery is expected to average about 63%, which is higher than uh, other forms of train travel. Okay, back to your next question was again. That was, um, do we know once funding is secured, how long it would take for the train to start running? 
It's gonna take about three years once we have the funding secured. The reason being securing rolling stock and um, a construction season or two for building stations and doing well, 166 uh, railroad crossing safety improvement projects. And the next question, um, often high-speed trains cause ground vibration for substantial distances. How will this high-speed train impact residents within the 100 feet of the tracks? So our maximum speed is 90. Our average is closer to 60 or 65. Um, that's considered higher speed, but there are trains that go faster than that. Um, in all of the studies that were done, environmental work that was done to see if we would be disturbing any natural habitat, any um, protected audiences, no issues came up. We received a, a finding of no significant impact from the Federal Railroad Administration, giving us the green light to move ahead with the project. Okay, and why are only some of the communities along this route actively supporting the project? In conversations I've had with a couple of the cities, there are um, local, local concerns. In the case of Coon Rapids, I have visited with people who are concerned about how North Star is performing right now. And they're concerned with uh, the overruns on Southwest LRT. And as we've discussed, um, NLX position is North Star should be more like NLX. And we're nothing like Southwest LRT because we're not building this track from scratch. Uh, in Hinkley, there's been a little bit of resistance at times because of local issues. Um, there's some longstanding, longstanding tensions with the tribe over other issues that spill into this one a little bit. And for the other cities, they are on board, chomping on the bit to, to get this moving. All right. Um, the next question, I think you did talk about um, being able to bring their bikes on the train is will they be able to bring bikes was that one yeah okay. and very easily very easily roll your bike on the train you don't need to box it up like you need to on some bus services uh no roll it on roll it off just like you could with a stroller much easier and the next question um they have access to get to rental cars um, and is there room also to travel on the train with skis or fishing equipment, hiking or camping gear? I don't have the authority to say yes to all of those things, <laughs> but I have not heard of a problem with fishing, hunting. I don't know about bringing a gun on there, but um, <laughs> hiking gear, I have not heard that that would be a problem. As far as car rentals, uh, Duluth, I'm not sure how far the closest car rental is away. And those services will continue to develop as we get closer to this is really going to happen. And next question, for the $30 to $35 ticket, can a rider get off and back on at different stations? You're going to buy a ticket to your destination. So if you're going to Hinkley, you won't pay the same price as if you're going to Duluth. So that would be an Amtrak question that I'm not real well versed in, but it's my understanding you're buying a ticket to get to one spot. And because there's only four round trips a day, it's not a hop on, hop off opportunity. I think, I think you're gonna buy your destination ticket. Okay, and would the tracks support a faster train? Yes. What doesn't support a faster train right now is the appetite for the budget. We started with a proposal to go 110 miles an hour, and that price tag scared people because the faster you go, the more safety measures you need to separate the tracks from anybody accidentally coming into contact with the train. So to keep the price in a spot that people can support, uh, we brought the speed down. Okay, and then another question about the, the track, a big issue with the North Star has been sharing the track with the freight trains. Has NLX considered its own track? 
we did not consider our own track. Uh, the, this corridor is different from North Star. North Star is running on BNSF track that's a main line going all the way out to Seattle. The volume on there is considerably more. Uh, I worked on the North Star project for a long, long time, and it was pretty common in the early 2000s that there were 60, 70 or more trains a day on, on the track that the North Star is running on. Uh, all the oil that was coming out of the Dakotas there for a while, as one example. The tracks going from uh, Coon Rapids to Duluth, because Coon Rapids is where they Y. Those tracks handle a dozen trains a day right now. And there's much more capacity that, that those tracks can handle. Um, and the, assuming state authorization, when would the first train run? In about three years after we get our funding in place. Would there be connection to other Amtrak lines? Right now, the connection to other Amtrak lines would be using the uh, Green Line because this service would, would terminate at Target Field in Minneapolis where it's really easy to transfer to LRT and scoot over to the Union Depot in St. Paul, where you can get on the second train to Chicago, or there's gonna be two uh, opportunities to board every day in St. Paul. There is talk of connecting Target Field and Union Depot. There is track there. There's a couple of engineering challenges to doing that. So that's down the road a little ways. All right. There's still a few more questions in here. So we've had a lot of really oh, good questions. So you're doing great. <laughs> All right. Um, is there any type of interstate concern with the small section into Wisconsin south of Duluth? Interstate concern? No. The concern in that area is uh, the bridge that I mentioned, the freight bridge that the repair is gonna make it so much more efficient for freight, but also will speed up uh, Analex's trip from Superior to Duluth. That's the, like one of the slowest spots in the whole trip is that short little span across the water. Okay, I, I was thinking he was talking about coordinating between the states. Oh, we have been, so, MnDOT and WizDOT have been working together on this all along. Okay. You're doing great. I feel like I'm kind of like, I'll give you a, a minute to take a drink and take a breath. And so I'm not rapid fire questioning at you. <laughs> Keep going. This is fun. All right. Um, will there, um, will there, oh, Pat, if you want to reword that question, I'm not quite sure on that one. Sorry. Is it safe and accessible parking at each station? Will there be safe and accessible parking at each station? I think that's what she's asking about the accessibility and the parking safety at the stations. Yes, there is parking uh, allowed in each of the stations, except Minneapolis. We're not providing specific NLX parking in downtown Minneapolis. All of the other station locations do include parking. Okay. And what portion of the rider fares is subsidized in the numbers um, being used for the fares? You'd have to help me with the math. So if the total is 18.9 to operate and we're gonna end up with a 7 million subsidy. So it's, what did I say? 63% is covered by fare box. So you're looking at 30%, roughly a little over 30% is subsidy. And a kind of a follow-up question to that, would these dollars come from the annual Minnesota transportation budget or are there other funding sources such as federal dollars? For those first six years, we're gonna be tapping into federal dollars as much as possible. And the conversations are happening right now about, okay, so where is the most likely source of the funding if it's up to the state? And those discussions, you're going to hear them throughout this legislative session. And that there's the directive is get that figured out this session. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping that comes to fruition. And another question, kind of following up um, about sharing the track. Um, do you already have an agreement with the Burlington Northern Santa Fe line um, for the use of the track? Yeah, that's a very logical question. And the answer is no. 
Uh, BNSF will sit down when the money is, is imminent. That, that's how they behaved in North Star. That's how they behave all over the country on these projects. The advantage we have is we anticipate Amtrak is going to be our service provider. Amtrak has authority to run on these tracks and they have the experience in working with BNSF to negotiate what that looks like. So Amtrak being the provider makes us a much easier piece of the puzzle. All right. And the next question, how was it decided to have Coon Rapids versus Anoka Fridley Ramsey Station, the locations? Sure. Uh, Ramsey and Anoka aren't eligible because they're not on the tracks that NLX runs on. Um, North Star and NLX share from Coon Rapids to downtown Minneapolis. Um, but North uh, Coon Rapids, NLX veers off to uh, Cambridge. Um, it was a, several different locations were looked at. Access was considered, impact on the, on the area. We're trying to minimize the disruption to, uh, to soil and to people and to businesses. So it, there was a, a long list and a, a several year process before Coon Rapids was selected there at Foley Boulevard and 610. All right, and that was the last one in our questions that came in. So unless there's any other last questions that um, are coming in, we'll just give one second. I don't see anything else. Is there anything else that you want to let us know that wasn't already included? Um, you had a lot of information in the presentation. I just want to share with you that I was so um, impressed with the people that testified at the Senate hearing on January 30th. Heartfelt. Uh, there were young people from college age kids, uh, half a dozen of them came and talked about what it means to them to have transportation options and how they choose to use public transit. Uh, they were very articulate. And to hear the veteran talk about wanting to ride the train so he could bring his wife to the VA hospital with him. And the business, the chamber leader who said, business needs, needs more transportation options in the, in the toolbox for everybody to succeed. Um, and the Senator uh, McEwen from Duluth, who said, I want you to imagine a July day in the Twin Cities when it's hot and humid and sticky and you don't want to move. I want you to imagine being able to get on the train and coming up to Lake Superior where you know there's always a cool breeze. And there, there are just a variety of people excited about the prospect of the train for a variety of reasons. And there are very um, intelligent people asking good questions uh, asking hard questions to make sure that this project does make it through this session, that it is in the best shape possible to succeed. Every every infrastructure project like this should be tested, and I really appreciate uh, the voices that are raising the questions too. All right, thank you, Jill. And beha on behalf of um, the League of Women Voters, thank you for being here this evening to share information on the NLX. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.